My name's Lindsay Grayson. I'm Head of Infectious Disease at Austin Health and also Director of Hand Hygiene Australia. And be, on behalf of Hand Hygiene Australia, I'd like to welcome you all this afternoon. We have a record turnout, 220 registrants, I think, which is about 30 per cent more than last year and most ever. And so for this afternoon's workshop entitled Hand Hygiene, then, now and beyond, and on behalf of Sally and Kate and Karen and the rest of the team, uh, and Kim, uh, Tim rather, who's uh, doing the filming, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. So we have a pretty uh, tight timetable and we'll try and stick to time, um, obviously. And we're going to start actually this year with a summary, which is a true credit to all of you um, and uh, the, um, the whole National Hand Hygiene Initiative um, because we thought we would present a summary of the last eight years of Hand Hygiene Australia. And this is particularly notable because it's about two weeks ago was published in the Lancet Infectious Disease, which is the highest ranking infectious disease journal worldwide, um, summarising uh, the Australian program and why it is unique and uh, like no other uh, worldwide. So I thought I'd just run through some of the slides from that publication. And uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, who've read it already, you're going to be a bit bored for the next 15 minutes because they're just the same frames. But for the rest of us, I thought it would be kind of interesting. So of course, all of you know that this is uh, started with um, an ad adaptation of the WHO uh, Safety um, Alliance for Patient Safety many years ago. And we have our own logos and uh, adaptations from that and that uh, it's a standardised culture change program based on this uh, WHO uh, Five Moments program to improve hand hygiene compliance among Australian healthcare workers, and that it's half fund it has a unique funding structure and it's half funded by the states and half funded by the feds so that there's ownership uh, at the jurisdictional level. And indeed, actually, the data is owned by the jurisdictions and we're just, uh, uh, Hand Hygiene Australia is just here to facilitate that. Obviously, everyone here doesn't need to learn this, but it's before and after patient contact, and moments one and four tend to pair, and two and three tend to pair, and everyone hates moment five. <laughs> so, uh, but we also know that uh, the patient surrounds often have their own back the patient's bacteria, and it's important that you do hand hygiene after touching the surrounds. So this was published just, as I say, just a couple of weeks ago in Lancet Infectious Disease, and um, accompanied by a very nice. Uh, editorial, which was highly complimentary, and for the first time saying this provided a roadmap for other countries worldwide to implement a hand hygiene program. And so, what we had decided to do was uh, undertake an assessment from 2009 to the middle of last year, and then the final slide I'll give you June 18's data, um, and look at a number of outcome uh, metrics. So, in terms of rates of hospital participation changes in the national hand hygiene compliance measured, as we know, three times a year, uh, the degree of educational engagement, the cost of the national hand hygiene initiative, or at least the cost of Hand Hygiene Australia. Obviously, you guys know that the, the cost of the alcohol rub in your time is borne by your institution. And then most importantly, the impact of the hand hygiene program on staph bacteremia rates, which up until now has been uh, difficult to quantify accurately. So this is a graph you've seen before, just showing the steady increase in the number of uh, institutions that are participating uh, in the National Hand Hygiene Initiative. It's, we now cover about 99 per cent of acute um, public hospital beds. Why isn't it 100 per cent? Well, there are a number of states have some very, very tiny hospitals which uh, don't have to participate every audit period, and so that's why there's 1 per cent. And, but pretty soon, in the next accreditation cycle, all pub private hospitals will have to participate because it's a requirement now uh, for accreditation. If you look at the total number of moments submitted to Hand Hygiene Australia, you see this steadily going up. We basically have about 600,000 moments submitted each audit period nationally. Um, so the database contains about 12 million hand hygiene moments. This is a huge potential um, uh, research tool. And, uh, and, and, you know, heaps of this can, uh, can come from this. You'll notice this steady, interestingly, the uh, second audit period in each year is slightly less than the others. And that's, you know, you all know that people, we put data in in March and then June, and then there's a bit of a gap to November. And so this variance here is very regular throughout um, each of the years. 
So here's just the audit data um, for up to June last year, and uh, we'll, uh, the final slide I'll show you June this year, which is just hot off the press. But you can see that 98% of all the moments uh, are coming from hospitals. 94% of the submitting institutions are hospitals, but that the remaining groups, as we've expanded out into these areas, the, the, it's great that they're involved, but the number of moments they submit is not that high, as a, it's only 1.9%. And this is actually kind of important to think about because we were worried that these, you know, like a dental facility, that could potentially pollute the, the hospital data, but in fact it, it's, um, the number of organisations is 6%, but it only constitute 1.9% of the data. And that the overall compliance nationally is 84.3%. Like in a talk later um, in this, uh, this afternoon's workshop, we'll talk about this issue of you know, how accurate is this, and there's been some publicity this year about that. We all know that weekends and night shifts might, might not be like this, and that's something we have to think about in terms of how we're going to move forward with auditing. Here's each jurisdiction or state. And um, you can see that really all jurisdictions have had a steady increase at about the same rate. Uh, it's uh, not a lot of difference between the various jurisdictions. Some started a little bit behind others and or, or others were, you know, already had established programs. But now it's all very mature and every jurisdiction is the same. Now this is a little depressing because this one slide summarises our entire program for the last eight years. So it's all on one slide unfortunately, it sort of makes you feel Seems there should be more to it than this, but anyway, every single dot is a hospital, and the size of the dot is the size of the hospital. And if they're 95, this is using a 70% benchmark. If the the 95% confidence interval is below 70%, then it's red. If it straddles 70% with the confidence intervals, then it's yellow. And if the lower 95% confidence interval is well clear of 70%, then it's green. So you can see the entire country represented here and you know starting off back in 2010 when we and then moving up the entire country nationally we've improved as a country in terms of our hand hygiene compliance and for a certain price I could tell you who those two large uh, red dots are still at the middle of last year um, they know who they are and they will improve I'm sure uh, this is what happens when you move the benchmark, as you know, that we've done to 80%. And so suddenly it, there is more red. And of course, this is an issue for managing this as a political communication thing, because some people say, oh, gee, it's all failed. You know, you've gone backwards. But of course, you move the benchmark around and the graph looks different. But nevertheless, you can tell that um, there's still been incredible improvement. Those two big red dots are still there course, um, but there's been, across the nation, there's been a clear improvement in hand hygiene compliance. Um, we can now split it out into acute hospitals, day hospitals and so forth, so uh, peer groupings if you like, and you can see this is just um, looking at um, you know, principal referral hospitals, group A, B, C and so forth. For those of you who um, want to take photos, you're welcome to have the slides at the end. You can take photos if you want to, but I'll just give you the slides, so um, it's up to you. Um, so you can see that there are still some, you know, largish principal hospitals that could do a bit better. This is using an 80% benchmark. But um, on the other hand, this sort of graph is, is quite, you know, quite good in that you can immediately compare apples with apples rather than a small hospital with a very large hospital. Uh, the typical graph by moment, so We've got this standard 10 to 15 per cent lower rate, particularly for moment one compared to moment three. Healthcare workers presumably protecting themselves with moment three. And of course, some jurisdictions, particularly New South Wales, have run some very nice campaigns targeting moment two and three, uh, moment one and two. And I'll show you in a minute that's really made quite a difference. And so this, the ability to report this data according to the moment, that is risk stratified um, the hand hygiene compliance being risk stratified, uh, is it can be very useful in terms of determining how you should uh, do educational initiatives. And so here is a graph from the paper where actually the entire program from 2009 to the middle of last year, by moment and then in red, the total hand hygiene rate, uh, you can see there's been a really pretty steady, almost all the graphs have got the same slope. Except for, the t except for moment two, and here's 
the, re the result of some of these jurisdictional educational interventions really focusing on moment two. So for those of you who think it doesn't make a difference, you know, some states like New South Wales and Victoria um, where they run these sort of programs, it does make a difference and it's reflected with very, very tight confidence intervals. Um, this is per healthcare worker and we've got this uh, typical thing for, for medical staff where they, they are lower than others. But, you know, for those, uh, you know, I've had one senior bureaucrat say what's happening with those filthy doctors and, uh, you know, it's not an educated comment actually because if you look at the data um, for, for medical staff who are in red and nursing staff, you'll see that basically the graph is identical, it's just the doctors are slightly retarded and that, um, <laughs> you know, they're sort of 10 to 15 per cent lower than the rest. And of course there are lots of reasons, many of them only work half a day a week at the hospital, the educational opportunities are less, I mean, we, uh, and so forth. And I think last year we discussed this, but actually if you, at least in my hospital, uh, the two key things that medical staff fail on is uh, not alcohol rubbing before they put on gloves when they go to examine a patient, so they just pull on the gloves. So it's a fail, but to me it's a soft fail, as long as they alcohol rub afterwards. Uh, and the other thing is at least is alcohol rubbing then walking in and pulling the curtains around without uh, realising the curtains are potentially contaminated. And it, at least at the Austin, if you took away those two issues, then the medical staff are at 80%. So, um, I think that's kind of handy to know in terms of educational initiatives. But you can see that there's really been a very pleasing improvement in all the health, different healthcare worker groups. Uh, remarkable actually that it's so consistent across all these different groups in terms of the slope of the graph. So many of you will be aware, we've, as I've already described, we've got the central database, the uh, app for direct uh, auditing. Uh, either on your iPhone or iPad, and this is we've done some studies and published in the, in this article showing at least in Victoria where we looked at this very carefully, it saves about 50% of the time if if you use the app and direct entry, um, uh, um, put in the data when you're auditing, saves on duplicate um, error, you know, entry. Uh, handling and so forth, and that these mobile devices are pretty cheap and you should think about doing this. And that obviously um, we've had New Zealand on board for some, uh, uh, some years, um, and, and just, just as in Australia, this is, whether it's New Zealand or here, it's allowed us to break things down in, by peer group or public versus private, bed numbers, and the ward types as I've just shown you. Now what's really exciting is, uh, as I mentioned, New Zealand's been on board for a long time and we don't talk about them being a seventh state of Australia, but in terms of data sharing, we're all just one uh, family, uh, sort of cousins, I guess. But what's been really exciting development this year is uh, we've just signed a, um, an agreement with the Ministry of Health in Israel and all the public hospitals in Israel will now be joining the Hand Hygiene Australia program and auditing the same as, um, as us so that we will be able to benchmark ourselves not only against the New Zealanders but against the 32 New Z um, Israeli hospitals, which is a kind of a nice um, uh, a collaboration because Israel has huge rates of multi-resistant organisms and in many cases, say in Victoria, we've pretty much adopted their CRE clinical guidelines and uh, as part of this they've, they've decided that they'll adopt the Hand Hygiene Australia auditing tool, so we're in the process of translate when when you go into the site, you'll either be able to click on Hebrew or Ingr English and then audit um, using the app the same way. So th th this is um, a nice um, collaboration. So we looked at the cost of the National Hand Hygiene Initiative. You know, a little clunky, but in the first, when we got st were starting, obviously there was an implementation phase and then a maintenance phase and then sort of embedment, if you like. Um, so the implementation phase was more, it's about 1.2 million a year. This is just for Hand Hygiene Australia, but you'll know that there was a lot of money went out to the jurisdictions. That's now been pruned back. In fact, we've, as some of you be aware, we've had another budget cut and that's why there are only three, or three staff and we've lost our secretary and one of our other staff because of this budget cut. But we're now running on around 600,000 a year. So. Interestingly, we decided, well, for the 15-16, which is the last, the latest year that um, we've got um, throughput figures, for, but this is for the whole of Australia, so public and private hospitals from AIHW, 10.6 million hospitalisations or just under 30 million bed days. 
and this was our budget. And so this is at least running hand hygiene Australia is equivalent to 2.2 cents per inpatient bed day or 6.1 cents um, per hospital admission. So I think most people would say this is uh, fairly reasonable uh, in terms of value for money for the organisation. So what's really exciting though is that you know right back at the start of Hand Hygiene Australia we wanted to include staff bacteremia rates and there's a lot, lot of discussion with Chris Bagley and, and others and it was decided this was just a bit too difficult and at the time and so we weren't able to do that and you'll be aware that Phil Russo and myself and a couple of others we had an initial look at whether there was any association between Hand Hygiene Australia and falling staff rates and we published this in um, uh, MJA some years ago but it's only based on a pretty limited data set. Subsequently uh, Brett Mitchell and Peter Collignon and Rebecca McCann who's in the audience had a very nice paper looking at overall hospital associated SAB rates but not aligning that with um, hand hygiene rates because it wasn't uh, available but we know that the staff rates seem to be coming down. So what's you may not be aware of is I think it was on the 22nd or 23rd of December last year, three years worth of staph bacteremia data was suddenly put up on the web by IHW. Everyone had just gone off for Christmas holidays and all this data was appeared. And for the first time, um, they actually named and listed all the principal Group A and Group B hospitals and ranked them um, according to their staph bacteremia rates. And rather remarkably, um, I think it's disappeared now, but at the bottom there was this little button you could press on it and get an Excel spreadsheet of every hospital in the whole country and their staph bacteremia rates, number of admissions and so forth. So we quickly downloaded that. And, um, uh, you know, because actually it then allowed us to say for the first time, well, actually we can, this was per financial year, not calendar year, but allow us to directly align that hospital's hand hygiene rates with their staph bacteremia rate, which was uh, a, a first. So what we did was we assessed the annual healthcare associated SAB rates for the 132 largest hospitals. So this is principal hospitals, group A and group B. These hospitals, the three groups, manage 77% of the inpatient bed days in Australia, so more than three quarters of the bed days. And we directly compared their hand hygiene rates. And um, this is full credit to Andrew Stewardson, who's a whiz with, compute, you know, with uh, statistics. But we then did a, a, um, an analysis comparing the hand hygiene rate at any one moment with the staph bacteremia rate. And what you'll see with this is the entire country with, once again, the dots represented by each dot is a hospital. And the size of the, the dot is, is the size of the hospital or how many moments they submit. And basically, for the first time anywhere in the world, we able, were able to show an association. We can't say that hand hygiene is directly responsible for this, but it's the only program that's been rolled out across the whole country in a standardised way, that there was an incident ratio of 0.85, which means that for every 10% increase in hand hygiene compliance, there was a 15% relative reduction in healthcare associated staph bacteremia. And this is based on an entire nation's data well, 77% of it anyway. Um, so this is pretty remarkable. And so in real terms, to give an example, in 1617, there were 372 fewer healthcare associated SABs than in 2010-11, and yet there'd been almost a 15% increase in bed day activity. Um, so this is, um, apart from 372 patients not getting staph bacteremia and everything else that that implies from a health you know, their lifestyle point of view, we know that each staph bacteremia is about $20,000, $25,000 excess cost to the health system. So this is a, a lot of money and um, more than adequately pays for your salaries as well as ours. Interestingly, when we split it out into principal hospitals, uh, Group A and Group B, you can see it's very reliable right across. It wasn't like a, an aberrant, it, it was very consistent. Now the only thing was that we were a little worried that with, there might be a time-based element, that as time went on things were getting better and it was time that was making the difference, not the hand, uh, hand hygiene compliance. So what we did was a delta analysis, that is if your, each period your hand hygiene rate at your hospital went up or went down and then we d just 
compare that to whether your staff rate went up or went down, regardless of when that was measured. And basically that delta analysis showed exactly the same thing, a, a trend. So there was an association, not with time, but just with the hand hygiene compliance rate and the staph bacteremia rate. So this is, um, and it was very consistent again, it was more notable for the larger hospitals, principal hospitals, and less for the smaller hospitals, as you might expect, because the, the um, variability is greater. Uh, so I think this is, this is the first time anywhere nationally, previously there's only been Didier Pitté's study of a University of Geneva, one hospital showing any association. This is the first time across the whole country that a nation has been able to show an association and the data set is based on a roughly 100 million bed days. So this is large. Uh, what's been good is uh, community engagement and there are you know, a bunch of these things, I guess. This is the thing I'm most proud of. This is my daughter's um, 2009 English uh, comprehension exam for the state of Victoria where every child had to read about alcohol-based hand rub and answer questions about whether they understood English. Um, she's uh, now a med student and doesn't do hand hygiene particularly well, but she, <laughs> she got a great score in English. So. <laughs> um, Obviously we've had other engagement uh, like this and I guess we're one of the few uh, programs where we sort of get this sort of political comment and some of you might remember back in 2010 the Abbott government, the Abbott opposition refused to say, con confirm that they would continue funding Hand Hygiene Australia and the National Hand Hygiene Initiative and this cartoon came out on page three of, um, uh, ten, uh, of The Age and uh, they went on to lose that election to the Labor Party. They changed their policy and then won the next election. Uh, might not be because of hand hygiene, the National Hand Hygiene Initiative, but they became more enlightened. So as I say, this was published um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Nice editorial being very complimentary about how for the, this was a, a way forward for other countries. And it's full credit to all of you and everyone involved in the National Hand Hygiene Initiative that this really is a first. So what are the latest data just from a few months ago? And you'll see we've broken the 1,000 mark now so that we've got 1,017 organisations submitting. Still roughly the same, you know, obviously the number of hospitals. The only increase really is in private hospitals. All the public hospitals are involved. And we've got this slight tension where we've got long-term care facilities and dental facilities wanting to join the program, but you know, how much disease transmission really takes place in dental facilities? But it's hard to say no, but on the other hand, we, pro we, we need to keep the data slightly separated just so that for those of us who work in hospitals where most of the disease transmission takes place, that we can see what our data uh, really means. Um, so in summary, Hand Hygiene Australia program, the National Hand Hygiene Initiative, is the largest and most successful worldwide. Um, currently over a thousand sites submitting data, more than 12 million moments. There's been a marked um, improvement in national hand hygiene compliance. Uh, overall rate this year being 85.1 per cent. Medical staff uh, improving but not quite enough. And that about just on 95 per cent of hospitals are either similar to, that is straddle the 80 per, 80 per cent benchmark or above it. Um, and that for the first time we've been able to show that the program has been associated with declines in uh, healthcare associated staph bacteremia. So thanks for your attention.